We are live. Welcome to 2022's Morbius in 2D Review and Thoughts. I've been meaning to try to start these videos by just very briefly giving, just letting you know if it's going to be a particularly positive review. This is not going to be a particularly positive review. I'm not sure it's as bad as some are saying, but it's it's pretty bad. And yeah, you know, I'm I wouldn't I'm not the first point person to point out that it's appropriate that they release it on April Fool's Day because it's you know, if you if you don't watch it and you just read people's reviews, you're going to think, "Oh, haha, ha, April Fool's Day. I get it. There's no way the movie's that bad." There's no way they put that in the movie. So, you know, and, and it is it is a joke. It is it is a terrible prank played on everyone who likes not just comic book movies, but just likes looking at things with our eyes and, and hearing things with our ears. There's there's a couple of parts that look good and sound good, but mostly Oh boy. Okay, so I realize this video is long. I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth the time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. It's its length. Check the time codes in the description box. Now, I am going to speak relatively fast for at least some of this because of my back pain. I am not going to start spoiling the, this particular movie until I put up the spoiler sign. If I spoil anything before that, I'll hold up an index finger while I spoil to mute, skip ahead, and choose you on my index finger. I might spoil the three MCU Spider-Man movies and Venom 1 and 2 since they are technically in the, you know, there's, a, there's some connective tissue. And yeah, once, once I do get into the spoiler section for this, I will be spoiling everything about this movie, including the ending. So let's see. yeah, uh, just re very briefly, I I've read pretty much all Spider-Man I could get my hands on. I read it very actively between 1999 and 2007, and let's see. right, I yeah, I want to make sure to say if you like the movie. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is valid. I'm glad you liked it. I have absolutely no problem with people who did. You know, yeah. If you liked it, that's awesome. And let's see. Right. So, yeah. I ranked worst to best. These are Spider-Man movies and Spider-Man related movies. Movies Spider-Man shows up in. So, worst to best. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3. Let's see. Yeah, The, uh, the Amazing Spider-Man 1, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Civil War, Homecoming, Venom 1, Spider-Verse, Far From Home, Avengers 3, Avengers 4, Venom 2, No Way Home, and let's see, there's no way that ranking's right, yeah, I, I, please disregard that ranking, there is no way, I, I have no idea what happened here, worst, best, yeah, yeah, I have no idea what happened there, but, yeah, I should have read that through before I started reading it aloud. So, I haven't really been wanting a Morbius solo movie, like at all. Not sure if anybody has particularly. Does this movie change my mind? Am I glad it, it exists? Am I looking forward to sequels? Or the character showing up elsewhere is what I have written in my notes. No, the movie does not change my mind. No, I'm not particularly glad it exists. It dilutes the brand. You know, I don't, I don't think either of the Venom movies are good, but there's some hope for the future, but this, wow. I, you know what, I think 
potentially it, it could be salvaged. I think Jared Leto could work. I think there are a couple of times where he does really sell the performance, sell the, the character. If the character is just handled better, I wouldn't mind him showing up somewhere. And and I do like the character. I, I think it's interesting to have the, the character, you know, the, there's this anti-hero quality to him that, yeah, he's, he's potentially a really compelling character. So, content warning and or trigger warning for torture, ableism, gaslighting, let's see, murder, body horror. And bullying and other abuse. Now, the movie's rated PG-13, so is this video. I, I'm i going to briefly quote a uh, fellow, fellow, couple fellow critics here. Morbius certainly has inspired ideas for macabre looks and superhuman events, but it's also PG-13, which mutes the malevolence as blood is colored black and open wounds are awkwardly concealed. Like, seriously, it's, it's ridiculous. Much like Venom before it, Morbius is adapting a darker character and meets him with a darker tone. However, it's frozen by its PG-13 rating. The blood on display is dark, almost black, done to get away from ratings, I'm sure, and even the word blood has been switched with the red for some reason. I, th I think that is, yeah, just straight up. I don't know if the, the MPAA asked or, like, the producers of this movie just offered it up, you know, figuring a... They have weird priorities sometimes. I will say, like, if the MPAA, like, looked the Sony people in the eyes and said, if you're going to make a PG-13 vampire movie, we're going to need you to refer to blood as the red. That, that's some top-level trolling right there. That is That is just... Beautiful. I th there's your April Fools. Like that's like you can just imagine them like laughing once they're in a room together. Like and then get this, get this. I told him, I told him, you can have your PG-13 vampire movie, but you gotta refer to Blood as the Red. No, no, he bought it. I he bought it. Just just wait. Watch the movie. I'm sure he bought it. Back to critic reviews. While, <laughs> right, critic review quotes. While the tone of the film is broody and dark, both in content and lighting, Morbius approaches a line and continually jumps away from it. Pulling its punches is understandable and an issue other Sony ventures have had. I mean, where was the carnage with Carnage? But Morbius lacks a scene stealing star to keep you bought in. The premise sees Dr. Mike Morbius, Jared Leto, attempting to cure a rare degenerative disease he and his best friend Milo suffer from, and in doing so transforms himself into a blood-sucking monster. Alas, this transformation occurs off-screen with, with little in the way of build-up or suspense and without a good reveal moment. In fact, despite the obvious horror elements, this aspect of the film feels disappointingly restrained, no doubt, in order to garner a PG-13 rating in the USA. Ironically, Morbius has been given a 15 in the UK. I don't know very much about the UK ratings, I just know American and Danish. And, fun thing, here in Denmark, it is rated... Yeah, we, we don't have PG-13. We have ages 11 and up, and we have ages 15 and up. Also others, but that's relevant for this. So, you probably already guessed, the Blade movies are also rated 15 and up. So, this movie, as far as censors go, around here might as well be as bloody and gory as a Blade movie. I, you know, I, I don't really blame them. I would not show this movie to an 11-year-old. I'm not sure there are very many PG-13 movies that I would show to an 11-year-old, but it, it just, it's it's kind of a, a funny, like, they might as well just make alternate cuts for the countries that are going to get a 15, you know, anyway. Anyway. Once the transformation has occurred, the story gets going, although it still feels quite choppy, as though a lot of scenes had to be trimmed or removed or entirely to keep the film under two hours. I'm not sure it's it's a timing issue, but there's definitely stuff cut, 100%. So, yeah, the video's not going to contain any 
Eclipse and let's say, yeah nobody forced me to watch this movie nobody forced me to make this video and it's not that I'm upset at how the movie compares to what it's adapting to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing let's see that brings us to the plot so yeah Morbius, Michael Morbius and Milo something or other are friends since childhood mostly because they both, it starts because they both have this rare disease and you know Morbius spends you know 25 years trying to, well it's not all 25, he spends years, he spends uh, 20 he spends years. Yeah, they they meet his kids. Then then you know he gets an, an education, and spends a spends time trying to develop a cure for it, and accidentally creates this you know fake blood substitute thing, and then he starts looking into vampirism. I don't think it happened quite like that, but that's kind of how the movie presents. Like, like, you know, they're, they're talking about, oh, you know, Nobel Prize because blood substitute. And then it cuts, and then, like, his his love interest is like, I just, I'm not sure about this vampirism thing. And I, I should, that's not verbatim, but, like, they go over the things, and the things include splicing... Bat, vampire bat DNA with human DNA and he's got like this this room of of bats and it's like dude just you like the aesthetic just we, we get it it's it's fine you know like but just don't up to it stop, stop pretending that it's it's it's, just, it's absolutely ridiculous anyway so yeah and the the you know it it's What's the word? Yeah, you know, vamp vampirism follows. Now, yeah, so I wanted to briefly say, I think the right way to go for the Venom movie was to make it a werewolf story. I really wish that they had done it for those, and so yeah, I wrote, I'm hoping they'll do it for this, don't make him a hero, don't even make him an anti-hero, you give him a human being who can barely restrain the monster within. Make him a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And yeah, that's not quite what happened. What happened was disappointingly up just like we knew we knew this was gonna happen. I mean, okay, I guess it's possible not not everybody realized it would be worse than the Venom movies. But it was it's not a huge surprise that it's this is not very good. Now, yeah, so the Venom movies are like 2000s movies, like Catwoman, Ghost Rider, and so is this. My theater didn't have a 3D showing, hence why I'm not, you know, yeah, this is a review of the 2D version. I have not watched a 3D version. So this was written by Burke Sharpless and Matt Zazama. And they're both credited with both screen story and screenplay. The let's see, is this uh oh is yeah, I think this was yeah. They both together wrote the new Power Rangers movie, Gods of Egypt, Last Witch Hunter, Dracula Untold. And some Lost in Space episodes. Okay, I have no idea if the Lost in Space show was... Oh, 20 episodes. Okay. I have no idea if that show was, was any good. But those are those are bad movies. I'm, I'm told. I'm fortunate enough to have missed them. But yeah, the the writing... Oh boy. The, the writing 
the storytelling is terrible in the in the first chunk of the movie it's jumping back and forth not not like an absolutely absurd amount of times but too much we start with you know the the bit in the trailer where morbius like puts out his hand and the the bats fly at him and then it cuts to 25 years earlier and then it you know there's there's a few scenes and then we have them on the boat for that expedition and i'm sitting there in the theater like i'm not i'm not like confused i'm not i'm, I'm not like i'm it's how do i describe it it's not that i'm i i sat for a little bit thinking okay does this bit on the boat take place before or after he went to the cave cuz and and they didn't have to do for one thing it would have been fine to just open on them as children that's 100% fine that's if if you absolutely if you really badly want it like a dramatic moment there's a dramatic moment when they're children I guess I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give away, but there's there's this really really dramatic moment. You could open on that and then cut back to a little earlier and then build up to that, because it would be fine to know that that's coming up. But it goes from the cave to the past to the boat, and you're wondering. I I I don't think I'm gonna say in this the video in this part of the video maybe in the spoiler section but yeah you're you're sitting there not like super confused or anything but you're like wondering did the cave thing happen cuz it's kind of it kind of matters cuz it looked real dramatic and you're like i mean the cave thing is going to be what triggers the transformation right like you you're you can't really you can't pretend like it doesn't matter and that's kind of what the the story structure does. It kind of presents that. So this was directed by Daniel Espinosa, who's like Swedish and ch ch Chile ch Chilean. I want to say it's called. He's directed, or he ha he's credited with nine total. Two of them he hasn't done yet, but they're announced. This is the first thing I watched by him. I promise I'm not gonna. This movie is not going to destroy my faith in him. I've, you know, I've I've heard a lot of different people say independently of each other he's a great director. So, it's, you know, plenty of plenty of talented people end up with at least one really bad credit. Yeah. I want to say Life from 2017 was the one that I heard people praise and yeah. Let's see. So the Yeah, the the um, life was rumored to be a prequel to Venom, which, from what I hear about life, would have been yeah, way way cooler than yeah. And if Gary Gray and Antoine Fuqua turned down the offer to direct this movie. Yeah, I could I could see them doing doing this somewhat. And this is Jared Leto's second comic book role after playing the Joker in Suicide Squad. Let's see the Yeah, and and Morbius was supposed to make a cameo appearance in in Blade. That's not a spoiler for Blade. And I I saw critics say that you know if this movie had come out at you know at the same time as some of the Blade movies for that time and that franchise it would have said it would have made sense. Released like this today it feels like two steps back, not one step forward. And. Let's see the um, 
Yeah, so quoting a fellow critics here. The first act is a mess, jumping from location to location, flashback to present day, never settling down long enough to introduce the main characters fully. And... Yeah, so I am, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. Let's see, does it fit with what came before? Basically, yes. Am I happy with how the movie ends? I mean, I'm happy that it ends. No, no, I'm not happy with how it ends. There's not really Deus Ex Machina. There is a uh, convenient right? No, not not especially. So there's there's some convenient writing in the movie. Not that much dealing with the ending. The movie has two post credit scenes, although the end credits were still rolling after the second one. So I, I, I think we may... I, I don't know if it's, it's just for this movie or if it's a general thing, but I'm fairly certain the, you know, the, the people working at the, the theater who have to clean up after we leave are very grateful that the movie chose to do it like that. This is a movie that loses your interest a, a lot of times during it. You know, I, yeah, it's it's very, it, it kind of starts and stops a lot. I like the, the superpowers on display, and I thought there was some really good use of them, but as others have pointed out, we don't get a good sense of what their limits are, which, like, you know, if you just want to show a character doing cool stuff, whatever but like once Morbius is in danger it's like well what can he survive because we like clearly there are some things that you know he can survive that a normal human being couldn't but we haven't really been given a good idea of what exactly can kill him so yeah and yeah, that brings us to the characters. So Jared Leto, according to IMDb trivia, Leto was rumored for another vampire role. Lestat in Josh Boone's failed Vampire Chronicles reboot. Josh Boone. Yeah, I, I guess I could kind of see that. Yeah, you know, various critics have pointed out he's just, he's more fun when he's, like, overly energetic than when he's, like, really brooding, and he broods a lot in this. There's not, he doesn't get to, to be fun or energetic or charismatic very much, and it's just too bad. Because I watched that movie too, Raul. You know, he's just, he's he's more fun when when he just completely let's loose you know just yeah you know so so yeah panic room uh requiem for a dream you know that kind of thing that's that's the kind of leto you want in your movie that the the fun kind but yeah matt smith as loot why does it why do they spell it like that anyway in, in the movie, they call him Lucian, but here it says Loxius. I guess that's the comic book version. Anyway, it's, he's, he's really fun. Like, the, 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 the energy and just the, like, I've, I've seen um, at least one critic point out that he dances. I don't think I saw anybody point out he dances multiple times in separate scenes. You know, we're we're not. It's not. It's not Joker. It's not Joaquin Phoenix. You know, dancing every two every other scene. Love that movie, but it's fun and just the yeah, like basically, he feels like the the this whole vampirism thing means that they can just go out and have fun. They can live life without consequences, basically. And, yeah, just, you know, 
he get he gets really really high on that idea and just yeah. Adria Arjona plays Martine Bancroft. It's such a thankless role. I, you know, she seems likable. I, it's just yeah. Like she she's she's constantly having stuff explained to her that it seems like she should know, and she's not really doing much, having much of an impact. Let's see. Um, now, I guess that is it for... Yeah, so the cinematography is handled by D.P. Oliver Wood, who has 50 theatrical credits to his name. So, he's he's very trusted. So yeah, he DP'd Surrogates, the three born trilogy movies, I'm I'm still really relieved that they never made any Bourne movies past the trilogy. It would just they would all turn out terrible, obviously. Uh, let's see. Yeah, right. He he DP'd the 2005 Fantastic Four. Bad movie. Good cinematography. Seriously, if if you watch it, it's it's very yes. And let's see what else. Oh, Face Off, Die Hard 2, yeah, U571, I don't like U571, but it's a well-shot movie. Yeah, the, the, sometimes the cinematography is really great. There, there's this scene where, like, there's this hospital hallway where it's like, you know, okay, it would be ridiculous to light this entire thing all night the the whole thing so so what they did what they did was there's a motion detector and the and the light comes on like like if you know if you, if you're walk if you're walking here then the lights will come on over you but if you go over here that light switches off this light switches on so you know and yeah i don't i don't have to draw your freaking diagram here Part of the hallway has someone working at the hospital. Another part of the hallway has a vampire. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a it's a good idea and it's filmed well, it's edited well, the sound design is is just fantastic. It's you know, yeah. Occasionally the movie looks really good, and that's one of the cases, but a lot of the time it's also very bland, sadly. And let's see, that brings us to, yeah, the special effects are a very mixed bag, like some of the time it looks, like, there's some really, really well done effects, and then there's some that, where it's like, Okay, they knew this movie wasn't going to make money, so they didn't want to spend more money on it than they absolutely had to. And let's see. The the action is also very fairly hit and miss. It's and there's definitely some creative stuff. A good use of superpowers, some. And the the score is handled by John Ekstrand, also Swedish, 23 theatrical total. And he's done all of the director's completed films. And you can understand why. They, they, they do work well together. Like, the music complements the visuals well. I already talked a little bit about sound design. Like, you know, it's a, it's a vampire movie. 
I'm not breaking any scientific ground here by pointing out vampires don't exist. There's no such thing as like the the, the fangs growing and and chomping into to necks and you know sucking up blood. And so these are not things that you can go out. You know th these are not things that okay if you shoot a vampire movie then you know what whatever it's gonna come naturally the way dialogue does. You know if unless you completely screw things up you probably got you know for for dialogue scenes where you're not in a ridiculously noisy environment or something you got audio on you, you got yeah you got audio of the dialogue but you can't do that for vampire stuff they have to do it in you know like foley work they did a really good job here the pacing is very weird at times it feels like the movie's much longer shorter farther along, less far along than it actually is. Yes, all of those. Not not at the same time, but in the same movie. Okay, uh, this is where I try to think of something positive to say. What what is What is the best element of this? Honestly, when the, the on the couple of occasions where it just lets like wh where it acknowledges, okay, this is a this is a horror movie, and like let's let's stop with this ridiculous nonsense. No, no, let's just let's go completely wild and just be a horror movie. And it's never it's never like really graphic horror movie, but like tension and suspense really work. Like the the hospital hallway is a standout. Like, if I had to point to one scene, that would be the, the, yeah. <sighs> okay, so the worst thing, it's difficult to nail down to just one. I guess if I had to point to just one thing, it is the, the umbrella of all of the things that make this feel so much like a early to mid-2000s a comic book movie. Now, let's see. So the what else? Right. This uh, this has a nineteen percent on Rotten Tomatoes, based on what does it say? Fifty eight reviews. Only eleven of them are fresh. So that's yeah. The average rating was 4.20 out of 10. And on Metacritic, it has a 37 based on 24 critic ratings. On IMDb, it has 4.8 based on 1,348 votes. Now, it's not all bad. 19.4% voted 10. And that's I'm again I'm glad they liked it. Twelve point five gave it six, ten point two gave it five, nine point three gave it seven, but twenty five point five gave it one. Which is a tiny bit harsh, but at the same time I I saw someone say that the in some ways this movie could be you know, obviously not as, as gory as Cronenberg's Fly, but it has elements of having that same sort of, of you know, a, a less gory The Fly. a Perhaps a gore-free The Fly. And it, do, it does. It could have been. It absolutely, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what that exactly looks like. But it it had the opportunity, and it just didn't. Let's see the. I guess. Holy crap! I I I thought I was gonna end up. Before watching it, I thought it was gonna end up giving it a seven out of ten. Yeah, that's definitely not happening. Uh, let me think. I'm sure I would. Uh, let's see.
yeah so I think it boils up. Yes, yes. I am rating this three morally conflicted vampires out of ten. I think that. Yes. So, a one is the lowest rating I could give. So, I'm giving it one up from that for the times where the movie is legitimately scary, and one up. Because some of the time, the fact that there's promise here makes you makes you figure, well, maybe we'll, next time we'll get a better movie, instead of making you think, wow, this is a lot of wasted potential. <laughs> but yeah, so this is, this is, I, I consider this worse than the Venom movies yeah the the and any any live action movie that's that's connected to Spider-Man in some way they're they're all better than this so that brings us to the thoughts sections here we go from here on out spoilers for the movie with no warning and we're going to start with the notepad of notes taken while watching so Honestly, I thought the the friendship between uh, the you know Milo and Michael worked. At first, I was worried it was only going to work with the child actors, but it worked with the grown-up actors as well. I I do. I really hope that that at some point. I mean, I guess it's the trope shows up here because these are movies that are still that still feel like they were made a really long time ago. Anyway, this movie actually has the trope that one of the re one of the ways we see oof, is this you know, this person might not be entirely a good person is that they lash out. At a bully, you know the the Milo physically attacks, and I'll grant it is uh, physically assaults, and that is what it is. The the bully, one of the bullies, when the bullies are trying to, you know, they're they're yeah they they're keeping his, you know the the note away from him. I 100% grant Milo was the one who escalated that to the point of violence. But the idea that, like, like clearly, the movie wants us to think that, you know, ah, oh, he's going to turn out to be a bad guy because, he, you know, because that's the, like, in stories like this, it's always, you know, if, if the kid doesn't just accept the abuse without, you know, hitting back yeah and the um, yeah I noted that a lot of the dialogue is just there to deliver exposition I personally found the the banter between Milo and Michael perfectly fine it wasn't like funny but you know, it was it was okay. I I don't I don't understand why Morbius has the the big like see through cylinder full of of like vampire bats from Costa Rica. They specify 
those are bats from Costa Rica for for research for research purposes but he also has to go to Costa Rica and like stick his hand to where the they're coming like are they are those Costa Rican vampire bats different from the ones he already has did he personally go all the way there to pick those up too and he doesn't even interact with them in any meaningful way until after that research expedition so why not just have it be empty when we see it before the expedition and then like when he goes and sticks his hand and we also have this bit of like the mercenaries like I don't, I don't know how you can't how, how how do you catch a bat uh, an elaborate riddle uh, may, maybe like uh, attack his his uh, dynamic duo sidekick so, something like that and and just and only have the bats be there in the cylinder after the because that's when they need to be there anyway I get that if they weren't there then he couldn't be like oh they accept me as one of their own and it's like dude is that just like a cuz you know at first like I saw the the cinema snob or, you know yeah that that channel review of it and he was like oh you know he's basically I, I don't think he uses the that exact term but he basically says telepathically he can control bats and I was watching the movie and I'm like, it doesn't look like he can telepathically. It just looks like, oh, you know, there's a kinship. But then, no, no, the ending scene, yeah, that's that looks like telepathic control. That doesn't look like they're just, like, helping him out or something. I noted that none of the... I, I don't think the movie made me laugh even once. And... Morbius kills the mercenaries, and there's some weird editing. I I think the problem was that they, you know, they wanted this horror movie scene, and maybe they originally filmed it. Maybe it's a maybe it's a ah, what's that volcano movie? Pompeii. Maybe it's a Pompeii situation where they did film it for R rating and then the studio went and forced them like the executions at the start of Pompeii but yeah it's just it's just really cut I did appreciate that parts of it it's kind of like an alien movie or something like a xenomorph movie with him like up on the ceiling behind them and jumping down and attacking them it's just you know it's ridiculously convenient that Martine gets knocked out and I actually I have to I I don't why was she in the movie I I guess it's because they needed they they didn't want Morbius to be narrating like like a just straight up narration because she kind of seems to exist just so he can explain things to her that m many of which she should already understand and know it's basically there so he can say information so the audience can get that information. And it's just like, it's it's almost insulting. Like, you could replace her character with, like, a childhood doll he has that he likes to tell his secrets to. She has almost no agency, almost no effect on the plot. Like, she, you know, she gets knocked out so that there isn't this thing of like because the you know let's hypothetically say let's say that she wasn't knocked out would he still be going around like ripping up mercenaries like he does right in front of her then then you kind of like wow this guy's not even an anti-hero he's he's a villain this is monstrous you know who would do that in front of someone they care about but she gets knocked out and then he's like she got knocked out you must all pay for this and it's like I mean okay so the one guy 
obviously a hole. Don't kill him, but he's an a hole. He should have, you know, he shouldn't have shoved her like that. But the rest of them didn't have anything to do with that. Like, it's just, yeah. And then, you know, oh, she's in a hospital bed for a while, and the cops come, and they're like, you better talk to us. And she's like, no. And they're, oh, okay. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah. That, that was, I, I, I think that might have been my favorite bad scene because it literally accomplished absolutely nothing. It was two characters, the cops, who were always going around having no effect on the plot. And they interact with a character who also has no effect on the plot. And to get the, the three of them joined together as one in a great zen moment of no impact on the plot whatsoever. Like, if you cut that bit, nobody would think that it was missing. Which kind of is, a, uh, yeah, you know, a, a, a scene in a movie should not make you feel like, okay, this might as well not be there. So, then, after, after the mercenaries are dead, Milo and Jared, the other Jared, not not Leto. I can't believe I'm playing him. Harris, Jared Harris. You know he's like on on a pain scale, one to ten, and then the response is eleven. I mean that's almost a joke. Like, cause cause you know one two. 10 equals 11. If you add 1 to 10, that equals, it's, it's almost a joke. I, I, yeah, that is, that is like, it's getting dangerously close to a joke. I might have to report it. I appreciate that the, the fake blood won't work forever. It, it was, it was very, Blade Serum, which was, like, Wesley Snipes is not the best actor in the world. And, and for sure, Jared Leto is much more talented. But I found that significantly more compelling, you know, when, when Blade is dealing with possibly not being able to, you know, his serum. Yeah. And... Yeah, you know, at, at at one point, you know, Leto is is like, I've done things that you know no no one should should and and it's like nobody's forgotten about Suicide Squad, we we know, dude. And. I, I kind of, I think parts of the movie are just trolling. When, when Milo walks out of the cell and he pulls a full usual suspect, like, because they didn't have to, they didn't have to drag it out and milk it the way they do. I'll, I'll grant it's not as milked as in the actual usual suspects but like they they spend way longer on it than they had any need to any reason to and it just like I know I could be watching a movie that I mean I, it's, it's not, not a great movie people forget that it's you know it's it's the ending people remember when they think oh it's an amazing movie it's competent it's it's a competently made movie but it's you know more competent than this in a, in a lot of parts. 
and and like when when Milo's like on the street and is like you know there's just this sense that ah oh, he could he could do anything he could hurt anyone he wants and it's just like dude I I know I get it I want I wish I was watching American Psycho right now too you don't you don't have to remind you know. Right, and another thing, you know, the, the Dr. Martine, in addition to being there so that Leto can explain things to her, she's also there so she can be threatened by bad guys, and, like, yeah, the, you know, when, when the cops want to talk to her, when she pretends to not remember, you know, that establishes that the cops think that he might have something to do with it kind of thing or wait was that already is that wait no no it establishes that even when the cops come face to face with her and ask her for some information there she's still gonna say I don't know anything and when when Morbius like the co the coincidence the convenient writing when he finds the counterfeiters, he wasn't even looking. You know, I was, I, I got real unbreakable vibes there, and it's just like, okay, we get it. He needs a lab. Just have him like fly up into the air and use the echo location to look for someone, and then have it be that he's like flying around for hours, is almost about to give up, and then counterfeiter operation. Like, the idea that they would walk in in the like. What, ten minutes that he sits there and drinks coffee with Martin? Just, yeah. And, you know, he's breaking all the bones in that guy's hand. That was also a decently enough, like, that was, that was kind of dark and good sound design. You know, I... I'm pretty sure the the... You know they they owe the the Foley departments like like the the Foley guy's wife is now completely out of salary. You know that they they you know completely demolished all of it, getting all those bone cracking sounds. So you know you owe her a salad is all I'm saying. And. Yeah, the the bit with the lab just really gave me Dark Man vibes, which again, like, I get it. Better movies are out there. And and so there's the big finale, and then you know Milo is like, no, Michael, don't kill me. I mean, I don't mean to be insensitive about it but you're a little bit late on that Milo he he already stabbed you and yeah and then we have the, the mid credits and post credit scenes and just yeah okay so the mid credits these are such stupid. These are these are some of the worst mid credits and post credit scenes. So the mid credit scene says that for some reason Tombs jumped, you know, because of the the spell, uh, No Way Home. Somehow Tombs went from one universe to another, which isn't how. That spell is supposed to... Wait. Is this movie implying that that's what happened across the board? Like, all of the different characters were, were put in the wrong? Or is it just supposed to be this, this one that's the only one? It's just... Holy crap. Like, Sony have no idea what they're doing with this. They have no clue. Anyway... The implication appears to be that Tombs was put back in the wrong universe because nobody knows that he's this, you know, they're not like, oh, Adrian Tombs showed up in the wrong cell. No, they're like, 
who is this guy? You know, it's, I mean, he's, he's kind of, like, the people taking care of, like, in, in the, in the MCU, he is a familiar face to the, like, correctional facility, you know, they, they wouldn't be like, who is this? They, you know, so, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the bit where he is like, there's like a news report and he's being released and he's getting into a car and it's like, okay, so that's where, that's the bit from the, from the trailer where he's like, where he's talking to Morbius. But for some reason that's not there. You know, there's a lot of stuff in the trailers that's just not in the movie and it's just, I, I, yeah, it's really frustrating. I, I don't, it's fine that not all of it is in the movie, but there's just so much that's missing. Like, entire scenes. Yeah. Really, really important stuff. Anyway, then the, the post credit scene is Vulture pitching Michael Morbius on the, the Sinister Six, which is just like, Okay, Morbius appears like it, by the end of this movie, he's basically a good guy. There, there were a couple of lapses in judgment. First one being, you know, starring in this movie, but by and large, he, you know, he he didn't he did very few unethical things. You know, he he was ready to, to sacrifice himself to make sure that that he wouldn't end up killing people for blood you know he only killed the mercenaries and everybody's like I mean mercenaries they're they're evil they're they definitely did something bad we all agree on this it's like <laughs> is is like is one of the producers like brother-in-law a mercenary is that what's going on here because it was like really weirdly hostile in a way that's like and I'm also not even entirely sure what they're there for to begin with like did they expect like pirates boarding the boat or something because if that's the case then it, you know maybe they did but then why are the mercenaries treated like they, they really are just thrown, n nobody seems to care. Not a single character says that that was, like, really awful. As far as I recall, even when Morbius talks about, you know, oh, you know, potentially I could kill people, he's not talking about like I did with the mercs. He's talking about, like, no, 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 I mean, screw them. Who cares about them? But if I eventually, you know, I might at some point in the future, if because the, the blood substitute's not working, but yeah, the the mercenaries were basically there because they wanted a scene where Morbius kills people, and they didn't want to have to deal with him having done something like that they would acknowledge as being evil. Obviously, in real life, it would be evil. Now, I lost my train of thought. Ah, uh, that train car just went chugging out of there let's see I was going let's see right right Morbius over the course of this movie he does almost nothing unethical the the killing of the mercenaries is the the one you know big thing where he really does something kind of you know you could say oh he's you know doing he's he's taking huge risks with you know he is only he only, uh, what's the word? He only did experiments on mice and then himself. And, yeah, you know, it, it's, but, but yeah, so, so, like, how is he an interesting Sinister Six member? And that's, like, for sure, that's what they're doing. I don't even know what else it could possibly be. Tombs, his entire motivation in Homecoming was to take care of his family. Did his family make the jump over 
if so, it kind of seems like like you could so easily fix this. And there at the end, when he's you know he says Michael Morbius, I let's let's uh, join together and do some good or something like that. Just have him say, "I gotta take care of my daughter and wife," you know, something like that. But yeah, like it. One of the one of the main one of the reasons we love Spider-Man's Rogues Gallery is that they're complex, is that they're interesting. Divorcing the the character from that just anyway. And yeah, I don't know what what is his motivation if it's not his family, and if it is his family, why isn't he saying it to Morbius? Is it because if he knows anything about Morbius at all, that that's what you lead with, you know. Morbius, I too, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do extreme things, you know, for, but for the right reason, and here's my right reason, you know, like that's, that's exactly how you would appeal to Morbius, is saying, just like you, I have this thing, yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, I guess... Venom is supposed to be a member, but he already went through a character. He's already a good guy. Uh, you know. Craven could work. I, I, that, that, yeah. I still wish they cast Jason Momoa, because he looks exactly like him. But I do like Quicksilver actor number one. And, yeah. I, I, I thought he was good as Quicksilver. I liked him in Tenet. I'm sure I'll like him in Craven. Let's see the... Right, and I also, yeah, I noted, I took some notes from, like, trailers. Holy crap, this... I took notes for from a trailer on the 14th of January, two years ago. It's wild to think that it's been so long. Yeah. And... I have no idea. In in the trailer, it looks like Dr. Martine is like smiling evilly as he starts punching the the glass cell with his fists and he gets on his feet. And then she stops smiling evilly, like, you know, oh she didn't expect that. And it's like she's not even remotely a bad guy in the like wow. And Um, yeah, yeah, the, let's see, there's the, um, Yeah, there was a, a trailer that, you know, we got a um, good look at Morbius' face once he's transformed. And I, I, you know, yeah, they really nailed the, the shape of his face, the ears and such look basically exactly like the comic. His skin looks pale in the comics. It is literally white, but that's because that's how you communicate paleness in a comic book. It would look bad in the movie. He's not an albino. It's like it's basically like there's no blood circulation or something. It's not a, a skin. Uh, yeah. And yeah. In in one of the trailers, not. Oh wait. 
Yeah, actually, yeah, that is in the in the movie as well. It's just not, yeah. In both, he said, you know, he says, "I am Venom." It's just that in the in the trailer, he then jokes, and in in the movie, he doesn't, just, you know, really follow it up with another joke. But yeah, do people know that Venom says that? He usually kills people. He says that too. I guess um, Mrs. Chen, the convenience store lady, told people. And somehow didn't give away that she knows him personally. Like, considering that most people don't come come close enough to him. To yeah, because you know, in 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 Venom Two, he refers to himself as Lethal Protector when he's out. And I or does he say I am Venom? Anyway, let's. Yeah, and I already mentioned, you know, he's not really, he's definitely not a villain, he's not even really much of an anti-hero, and, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I have a really great critic, critic quote here. We get Jared Leto, who is supposed to be playing an enigmatic antihero. Instead, there is no mystery around him, and other than a sadness that sure listens, surely listens to the Black Parade. I I know your name is Shirley. There are no characteristics that mark his character as the Morbius we know. Additionally, there is no antihero in this take on the living vampire. Instead, his motivations are straightforward: to cure his blood disorder at all costs to save people. But the only cost is just himself and some rats. Beyond that, he is he's never once pulled over to the strength he has from the Red, and instead is dead set on sacrificing himself to save people from the film's antagonist. He's really just a hero. No wiggle room there, outside some miscommunication with law enforcement. I just saw that apparently the cop played by Tyrese Gibson was supposed to have, like... Of a robotic sort of arm, and we never saw that. And that's what was missing when the the bit on the rooftop when he's suddenly just there pointing a gun at Morbius. There was supposed to he was supposed to like use the arm to either attack or threaten Morbius. That's why it was so weirdly cut because they cut around that for some reason. I, this is the part where I would ask, you know, do, do you, how, how would you improve this movie? Or what are your favorite movies that are like this? You know, I think instead I'm just going to ask, what do you hope to see in the Craven movie? Do you think that there is any chance at all of Sinister Six working out? I, I do think that it would be cool, although it's not quite, you know, you can't quite turn them into like, ah, uh, what was the, I saw someone make a really great comparison. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, they're a group of villains who, tr who team up together to stop Spider-Man. You know, it's, it's cool. It's cool to see him fighting more than one villain at a time, but that's basically it. You know, they're not like... They, they don't really have an identity outside of that. But no, I, I think it would be cool to see Spider-Man fighting, you know, six villains. But I'm not sure this is the way to get there. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Moon Knight. And recently the reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you like if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.